Welcome back to Technology in the Tent, brought to you by Pitme and Arabnet. Today we have a very, very special guest, uh, <laughs> dear friend, super investor, super mom, just all around cool person, fun, always helpful, um, and has been along my journey, at least, over the last few years, always mm. helping me out, mentoring me, giving me advice, and really just been a... Uh, a really good friend and supporter and mentor, uh, Christine Heron from Mentor Capital. The best w intro I've ever had. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Word. I love it. Love it. It's a good start. Anyway, um, so we want to talk about who's Christine? Mm. What does Christine do? Because I know you've done a lot of things yeah. uh, all over the board. And um, just tell me a little bit, like, what, what's it like to be a, a mom, a VC, a, you know, a board uh, member of all these companies like what's your yeah. life like and say so that's a bunch of questions uh rolled into one yes. if we're talking about what's interesting and what do i like to do um i think the the best story i have for that is when i was um leaving an organization called omidyar network which mm -hmm. is uh pierre omidyar the ebay founders investment group and there's a combination of philanthropy and venture funding that comes through that group Anyway, so I had decided to, to move on. They were going to a strategic phase, which was not my cup of tea. And, uh, and so I left without knowing what I would do next, which is a very non-Christine thing to do. I mean, I, I am one of those people that has not necessarily the five-year plan, but at least a two-year plan at any given time. Okay. And, uh, and so as I'm, I'm on the way out the door, and people would always want to know, so what are you doing next? What are you doing next? And, uh, and I would tell people, well, I, I want to do interesting things with people that are interesting and I like, and I'm going to allow myself some serendipitous time to, to find out what those things might be. And maybe it's one big thing, maybe it's a few smaller things. Um, but, uh, for once I'm not going to, you know, sort of have the plan. And the, the joke I made was, you know, it's sort of, do you have to have the next boyfriend lined up when you break up with one? Plan B or C or <laughs> yeah. Like if you do, do you wait until you know who your next boyfriend is before you break up the bad relationship? And, and in theory, you're supposed to have that clean break in between where you mm. think about who you are and what sure. you want. Uh, it sounds pretty. Right. <laughs> but you know, you're not supposed to necessarily have worked it all out and, you know, know who you're moving on to. Um, and so I decided it was time to do that professionally as well, where I didn't necessarily know what the next thing would be. Um, How long was that break? So uh, so I spent about a year and I spent uh, probably a few months of that time with, with not much attachment um, other than uh, there were a few folks I knew at First Round Capital. Mm -hmm. um, I had worked with Rob Hayes Rob. Uh, at, at Omidyar and he went on to be a partner at First Round. So I set up a loose, you know, in-residence arrangement with them where I would work, maybe work with some of their companies, yep. do some work with them, you know, bring deals in. Was it a resident? Entrepreneur in the residence, or was it more just kind of we, help out? Yeah, we, we called it like a venture, uh, a venture, uh, uh, let me call it a venture in residence or something like that, because there was no intent where I would go start a company they would fund, right? Okay. So, which is more, the more typical entrepreneur in residence or EIR um, arrangement. Um, and I think that if you look around the industry now, there are many more arrangements like that, yeah. you know, because now people have, the you know, they have fellowships mm -hmm. or they have venture partners, yeah. you know, and venture partners meaning something a little different now than it sure. did before. For. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a more common arrangement now, but at the time, you know, like, well, we don't know what to call it, you know, let's just call it, uh, call you a venture advisor, you know, whatever it was we did. And, uh, you know, and you're basically going to do in residence ad hoc with us and bring us good ideas and, you know, help us look at a few deals. And, uh, so through them, I was introduced to get satisfaction, mm -hmm. um, to Lane and Thor, uh, and Amy, who are the founders there. And I ended up working with them about half time uh, during that year. So it was actually a really good time for me because I had, you know, one thing that was an anchor, you know, to my weeks where I was working with these folks I really liked and, uh, uh, and so forth. And, um, and then the rest of that time could be serendipitous time to just learn and see what people were doing and, you know, what trends were happening that I thought w uh, would be interesting to, to get involved with. Um, you know, one of them clearly what was going on with seed funding and going to first round at a really interesting time when there weren't a lot of seed companies. And, uh, and I think if you sort of take a snapshot then and compare it to a snapshot now of, how do VCs engage with community? What kind of platforms do investors try to build so there's structured value besides yeah. you know, a personal partner network? Um, I think there's a lot of change in how people approach that now for differentiation, um, as well as just you know, what's your engagement style. Uh, I think there's a lot of change now that was driven by you know, some of the work that was happening, you know, certainly by first round and, and a couple other firms uh, you know, back then. I call them boutique firms. 
Yeah. Right, like David Bloomberg was a guest, and uh, you know he's been around for 20, 30 years, and mm -hmm. we were talking about the changes. But so what's interesting is to me, um, so you're at first round, mm -hmm. and um, Mint. Name some of the companies that you're involved with. Uh, yeah, right before I was gonna go for it too. Oh, please, please. No, oh, no, because then you have the food oh, in the okay. mouth, and I'll, you know, I'll, no one wants to see the I'll, inside I'll, of my mouth. They want to see the outside. I want to see the outside. When I, uh, when I'm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit longer so you can have one. Yeah, just one. Just one. I'm going to get there for one. So I know Aaron, so you're a uh, right. board advisor to Aaron, but name some of the companies that you were involved with that first round. And, yeah. And specifically, what I want to know is how are things now different now <laughs> versus then being at Intel? Um, because mm -hmm. you did make the move to Intel. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, a mega fund. Oh, that's really good. Right, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I hate mommy you. Diet, uh, is not, I know. What are you doing? Not in effect right now. I'm not mommy <laughs> diet. Um, so yeah, tell, tell me what what is the experience? The difference because I think people don't realize how different it is when you're it's you, Rob, and you know a mm -hmm. couple guys at first round versus now I'm at this multi multi billion dollar fund mm -hmm. with you know obviously uh, million billions in sales and corporate uh, you know profit. Right. But but you know Intel obviously is uh, a powerhouse. Um, so t tell me a little bit about the difference between the two experiences um, that you've gone through right. with different funds. And, and it's interesting because the differences are, are definitely not what you would expect. Um, so at, uh, you know, if you're just going to do a on paper, you know, what are the differences, right? So uh, First Round Capital is a very traditionally structured fund. It is a smaller one focused mm -hmm. on a early stage investing. But the structure is fairly, you know, straightforward. Um, where it's a partnership, and you've got, you know, some partners on the West Coast, some on the East Coast. They yep. focus on primarily U.S. investing. Um, you know, average first check of five hundred thousand dollars, and a large number of deals each year. Well, with the intent of we will help intensely at uh, that first eighteen to twenty-four month phase, and then after that, you know, we expect you'll probably have proven that your idea, your, your assumptions were not correct, and moved on to something else, um, or you'll have been doing well, and you know, you'll bring in you know more uh, more investors that are appropriate for those later stages. How many deals a year? Uh, it's changed since I left. When I was there, it was around twenty-five deals a year. Okay, so um, I think they're they're and they're more now. I think it's more like thirty-five to forty now. Okay, for so. For a fund of that size to do mm -hmm. 25 deals, how many deals are you looking at? Well, it's all about, I mean, the, basically the math is how many deals per year, that's your average check size per deal, and then how many more rounds of financing after that do you expect you'll participate in, right? So you need a reserve in the fund to go to that. Um, and so at that stage, uh, for example, you know, it, it would make good sense to, for every dollar you invest in a very in a first check mm -hmm. to a company, you'd probably want um, two or three more dollars sitting behind it, okay. right? Because they're going to have more rounds sure. of funding. Sure. If you're a later stage investor, you might keep a very small amount for uh, res of reserve for follow-on investing, just because you don't think there'll be much after you. But I mean, does Intel do first checks? We do. You do. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's new because I remember, mm. or not. And so when, when I say first check, I mean the first check that the institution writes to that particular yeah. entity. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the first, first money that okay. that okay. the entity has raised. Um, so, I, so I think so. That's that's first round on papers, sort of very broad strokes. Um, and then, uh, and then Intel in very broad strokes is uh, not a traditional fund structure, but rather we invest directly off of Intel's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So Intel is the investor, not sure. a separate fund, um, which uh, uh, has other implications I can talk about. But um, anyway, and then inside that umbrella of Intel Capital, there are a dozen different teams that almost act like independent funds that are just very open with each other um, and are sort of generally aligned on sort of the broad strategy and then everyone's kind of got their different mandates, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are half a dozen teams who are based outside of the U.S. There's someone like me in 20 different countries, literally. Yep. I think it's 21 countries mm -hmm. now. Um, and, uh, and they are very focused on, you know, uh, total addressable market for Intel in those regions and expanding that, which will mean, you know, mobility in Africa and e-commerce in the Ukraine. And, you know, it yeah. means different things in different areas. Well, I don't know if you know this, but um, so Intel, I think, is behind an incubator or a program in Lebanon, which mm -hmm. is very tech. Uh, there's some relationship. And Farouz, I know he's a friend in Dubai, mm -hmm. who's left now. But, you know, Intel is actually one of the bigger funds that's active in the Middle East yeah. um, and doing stuff. And that's really cool. Very and tech. that's true. I think that's true in all other regions as well. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I think that, yeah, because what ends up happening is, you know, if you look at the 
dollars we invest each year, we don't, um, since we don't have a fund, it's not like we can say, oh, we're a hundred million dollar fund or a $500 million, you know, that's mm-hmm. not appropriate. Yeah. Um, but if you look at our investment pace, we are writing three to $500 million worth of checks per year. Wow. Um, and if you look at how much of that is going to new investing and you sort of do some rough math on, uh-huh. Well, so someone, a fund who was writing that much in new checks each year is probably what size, Hmm. right? Um, So if you do the math that way, um, we kind of look like a billion and a half dollar fund. Huh. So my question, I guess, what it really narrows down is the viewpoint that you have and that decision making process. Mm -hmm. How much different is it between? It's interesting. It's it's very similar in some ways and very different in others. Mm-hmm. So, and the the ways it's different, I think, would be surprising. Um, I, I know I was surprised. Yeah. So, when uh, you're in a traditional partnership, um, typically everyone around the table is also looking at deals, also bringing deals into the partner meeting, um, and you have uh, the firm overall will only do so many deals per year. Mm-hmm. So, there's a certain amount of uh, who. You you know, survival of the fittest in that room, uh, some of which has to do with the strength of the deal, some of which, you know, frankly, just has to do with the partnership dynamic. And mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of politics that goes into that, yep. as you might imagine. Um, you also uh, sometimes have uh, equal partnerships where every person in the room owns the same percentage of the partnership, um, which means they are more likely to have an equal voice in that room. But uh, more often than not, you have unequal partnerships where there's the senior guy who's been there, you know, 20 years, and you've got the new junior partner who joined this year, and, you know, their percentage ownerships is probably, you know, 20x, if not 30x, right? Um, And so those those votes do count a bit differently. Um, And sometimes you'll have a firm where there's one voice in the room, like the guy who started the firm, um, you know, and, and I don't think anyone would argue with the fact, you know, like for example, Josh at first round, certainly early on, you know, his was a very loud voice and, and over time as they bring more partners in, you know, that gets distributed. Um, but that's happened. That happens in most firms. You have a founder. Um, you sure. don't necessarily have like a cohort. Exactly. So, um, so you have a couple of things that go with partnership dynamics. Um, and since we don't have a partnership, um, it's, it's interestingly, uh, ownership on deals is more siloed. So mm. I don't go for approval to a group of people where I might have turned someone's deal down. Huh. <laughs> so no one approving my deals could ever be angry with me for turning down theirs. Okay. <laughs> That's right. So there, you don't, you, so you skip some of the horse trading sure. and yeah. some of the politics go away. Um, uh, the other thing that's a little bit different is, um, we do, uh, everyone is treated equally as far as ownership and the success of our companies. Um, so, uh, so some, from an economic point of view, you know, my incentive, um, is not any different, you know, from someone else's incentive. Now we might have different deals we worked on and that's, that's the other big difference. I think a traditional fund, everyone has the same pool of deals Mm -hmm. that they benefit or or don't benefit from. Um, and, uh, you know, in a corporate, you might only be attached to some deals like so I'm not going to be attached to a manufacturing deal in Belgium like that's going to have nothing to do with me it's not going to yeah exactly yeah I'm just I'm just making things up um I mean, we have our international deals, no, so kidding. yeah the, the, la la manufacturing not my area <laughs> yeah. but so do you have a yeah. specific focus yeah so that you look at yeah so like I said so we've got those international teams we have a uh, half a dozen teams that are uh, more sector focused and primarily those sector teams work with one or two business units each and mm-hmm. the idea is build out the ecosystem that you want to be thriving for those products and for that strategy or, uh, or ideally uh, it's primarily mid stage um, you know formally we're stage agnostic mm-hmm. um, but what stage we do varies uh, not only based on what sector it is, but what re- what geographic region it is. So, which is why it's, I try to tell people it's yeah. very different. Like Western Europe, you might see more late stage. You might see more um, enterprise deals. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you go to Africa, it's all going to be mobile. It's probably going to be early stage deals. You mm-hmm. know, so you, you see some different flavors. Yeah. Um, here in the U.S., you have those sector folks, and they are truly multi-stage. So it goes from, you know, sort of, I think the smallest checks the other teams have written has been sort of 500K. The biggest ones, you know, you're getting up to the tens of millions. Sure. Um, our team does not have the consumer internet team. We do not have a specific group we work with, but rather we're the, what's the stuff we don't know about yet, hmm. right? What's coming that's innovative, that's disruptive, that's yeah. changing how people engage with technology that 
we should have an early eyes and ears on. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, so I, I actually have a couple of deals I'm working on now, which I'd love to talk about and I can't just cause you know, they're, they're newest and okay, so they're shiniest. No problem. No problem. Um, you know, so for example, uh, one of my companies is jelly and what yeah. they do is, uh, they both crowdsource what's going to play next on a terrestrial broadcast radio mm-hmm. over you know FM airwaves, sure. um, and they also uh, use that same infrastructure to run ads mm-hmm. in real time and optimize advertising in real time, mm-hmm. like you get online, which right now radio certainly can't do, but U.S. radio alone is you know twelve billion dollars, sure. right? So that's a lot of ad money. Um, um, quick question: I just, I just had a thought. Mm-hmm. What percentage of your deal flow is Rob or someone that you know calling you and say, hey, Christine, mm-hmm. check this out? And obviously, I mean, I see you all all over the place yeah. at events, meeting people. I am all over the place. So <laughs> what, what's the makeup as far as stuff that you actually discover yourself or read on TechCrunch or, you know, right. you hear about? And how much is it really, you know, this collab- syndication uh, where mm-hmm. someone's put money in or they know you? Because one of the issues that I've noticed in the Middle East specifically is that because the pie is not perceived as big enough, it's not three, four, five firms doing deals together. It's like one, two. Yeah. And so when we talk about you know smart money and connected money, a lot of times part of the reason there's five firms in a deal is because it opens doors and it's smart. So right. Is that most of the deals? Is that how it happens? Like someone you know? Yeah. Trust? Well, I think there's a couple of different questions in there. And one of the questions I heard you ask is, where do I get my deals from? Yeah. And then the other one I heard you ask is, how does syndication work? What are yeah. some of the dynamics around syndication? Okay, Which is perfect. a different question to me. Yeah, but it's kind of important. So I want no, I they're both ask. important, yeah. but I'm mean, happy to answer both, just sure. clarifying a little bit. Um, so on deal sourcing, um, it actually hasn't changed that much, and I've been at a few different firms now, so uh, I would think if it was going to change, it would have. Um, I think it's, it's always been a mix for me of... Uh, Folks that I meet at conferences or out and about or I get introduced to, sometimes even socially, just from being in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. um, which you can't undercount how important uh, some of those social introductions are. Um, and, uh, and then sometimes it's someone I've worked with on another deal saying, hey, I'm invested in this company. It's time for the next round. And so you get, wow, oh. you, get, uh, yeah. you get something that way. Um, and sometimes it's just you know, folks approaching me directly that I hadn't you know, met before, right? Mm. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting. I actually have closed my first deal just the, several months ago. I closed my very first deal for one of those guys that comes up to you after you've spoken at a conference. Yeah, we can talk about, we can talk about that. Story. So, awesome. you know, you go <laughs> and you, you give a talk or you're on a panel and oh, you know, they have that break in between the yeah. sessions and they go, boom, like all these people run up and they want to try to pitch you as quickly as possible while the people in back are elbowing them or they want to get your card. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I spoke at the WHERE conference, gosh, almost three years ago. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, we were talking about location and, you know, uh, talk specifically got into proximity. And, you know, is that a more powerful driver of context than just here I am, like, you know, here's my Latin long on a map, sure. you know, which is not that interesting. Um, so, uh, so, you know, that got into that a little bit. And uh, this guy, Dave Matthews, not the band, yeah. uh, comes up to me. I at- him. There you go. <laughs> Comes up to me afterwards, and uh, he's, he says, "You know, I am working on exactly what you're talking about." And you know, your first response is always like, "Yeah, yeah, you and every other guy that just you know came up to the panelists' table." Um, and uh, so we started started this longer conversation, and he gave me a demo of what he was working on. You know, had it ready to go, and uh, it was interesting. And it's like, "Yeah, well, let's keep in touch." Just, you know, he wasn't raising money yet. So this that's the trick. Yeah, I'm not really. Uh, right. It's not necessarily either way. I actually some people have different reactions. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, I did not have the. I don't, I don't always have the. You're raising money now, therefore you're okay. bad reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're clearly better looking and a better investment if you're not raising money now. <laughs> um, so uh, so anyway, so we had a dialogue for about a year and a half, and then finally he got to a place where he was thinking about bring some money in and uh, we had an existing relationship and um, I hooked him up with some of the folks in uh, one of our internal teams. We have a a business unit that is looking at proximity and looking at, you know, sort of these connection frameworks that uh, things that we're launching this year at Mobile World Congress. And, um, and so we ended up making an investment there and figuring out what kind of commercial deals are make sense. And it's very exciting. Companies new air. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's an example of 
something does, you can actually get a deal that way. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen that frequently. Yeah, Whereas, right. you know, like Store Envy, my most recent deal, uh, it's a social commerce platform in a marketplace. Um, you know, that deal came a more traditional route where Kent Goldman from First Round is on the board there. And, you know, he gave me a call and said, hey, you know, Store Envy's going out fundraising. I think you'd like it. And met the CEO and there you go. Now, how quickly do those deals happen? Uh, how quickly a deal happens has not that much to do with where it came from. Okay, that's a good point. But but so yeah. that's not a not, point. not in my experience. Um, I get hit up by people saying, "Hey, I want to raise money from so and so," but like you just said, it took a year and a half of a relationship. But he also wasn't raising money sure. yet. But I mean, the point so. is that you were kind of aware, or he maybe may have sent you updates, or may have been mm-hmm. you know, some milestones. And uh, you know, not coffee every so often. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and you you're kind of in tune with what's going on, and then maybe at one point, obviously you must have been intrigued at some level. Yeah, and then because um, he was working on something, I was genuinely just and, and happened he, to be fascinated by. It was not, kind of yeah, himself, you know, like mm-hmm. maybe proved himself, maybe proved the business, and then I think to me, it's you know this idea of planting these the the right seed with the right person, and it's it, it is somewhat of a personal connection where you yeah. you have to click with the well person. at the early stage, early absolutely, stage, right. yeah. I mean, because at the early stage, um, there is there's not a lot of buffer in between the entrepreneur and the investor in the early stage. Yep. So if you don't want me in your hair when, you know, there's bombs going off all around you and, you know, people are quitting and the product's not working and the customers are angry. Like, we need to get along. You yeah. know, we need we need to basically, it's, it's like when you get married, you need to know how you're going to fight. Right? You need to know, like, are we going to yeah, argue? Yeah, that, that she had a fair fight. Yeah, the fair fight. No, I don't. We but, have that in our fridge. Do you? Oh, my God. <laughs> so I think maybe that's something that you need to give to the Pitme entrepreneurs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, how do you how do you work through a tough issue? And, totally. you know, and some of that can be structural. You can get a term sheet and get very detailed in your equities mm-hmm. uh, financing documents about, if in this scenario, this is how the voting will work, and I'm protected against this, and you're protected against that. Yeah. And you can do that, but realistically, you need to just have the chemistry that's going to get you through those times. Um, And I know, so for me, at an an early stage, uh, I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for who's the team, what's the product they're building, and how are they going to get customers in, and what's their customer acquisition plan, which is a little different from what's the market size or um, uh, is the space, you know, trendy right now or or things like that. Um, Because I think that if you have those three and you're really excited about those three, the rest can flow out because a good team with a good first product and they know they can get a million users on it, they're probably going to figure out how that evolves into a big market. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, not always, but, but typically those guys are going to do a better job than the ones who come in with the great big business plan full of market research from, you know, Gartner and, and so forth, um, uh, that says something's big, but I have no conviction whatsoever that you're going to get a piece. Okay. That brings up a really <laughs> good point. So I talked to a company yeah. the other day and really bright entrepreneur and I think she's going to do really well. And I asked her like, what are you trying to do? And she's like, I'm raising a couple of million. I'm like, why, why so much? So mm-hmm. she got... Two, three hundred thousand seed in, in the Middle East, right? And she's like, "Oh, well, customer acquisition is going to be really expensive." Yeah, I'm, I don't like I'm, that I'm answer like, whatsoever. Like, I can tell you right now, no one's going to like no that answer. No one is going to invest. Listen, Mm-mm. you heard it here. If you're raising no money, no one, no one. ABC. <laughs> the second you say customer acquisition is going to cost anything, right? And to yeah. Through the model, the deal is dead, right? So. You know, that's these are things that the entrepreneurs there don't understand, and you know, we want to we want to tell them, you know. You have to figure out how to transfer the burden of distribution or customer acquisition with as little money as humanly possible. Yeah. That's that's the trick, you know. And, and you have to do it. You don't necessarily have to have built an, an enormous yeah, business. No, with no, you know, you're going to eventually pay to acquire customers. Yeah. That's what happens. Um, but there needs to be enough sort of inherent demands in yeah. your market where it's pretty easy to get that first set. Sure. Right. And, and if you have to go out and do a ton of education, if you've got to go, you know, pay Tapjoy, you know, whatever that is, just to get a first wave of users, that's, that's not a great sign. It's not a good sign. Um, you know, and it's interesting. The, uh, I had someone, this came up as a point um, on the funding panel at the um, uh, music tech uh-huh. uh, conference right, yeah. yeah, last week. And, or was it this week? That it's been a long week. Oh my God. Seriously, yeah. this is the week I've had. Um, God. <laughs> 
So, uh, so anyway, you know, when these questions came up about, you know, funding and, you know, what did you need to have done? What kind of traction? I was like, look, you need to have someone on the team that can sell it and someone that can build it. Um, and you probably need to have something built. Someone who comes in and they've got a great idea and it's a good market, but they haven't built it yet. Um, and they don't know how they're going to, like, that's just never going to happen. Um, it's, but not in today's environment. In today's mm-hmm. environment, building out a technical product, you know, unless you're building, you know, solar batteries or something where you have real physical costs, um, building that first product should be very capital efficient. It yeah. should be something you can do off of sweat and a few drops to, like, buy server time. Exactly. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, again, sort of specifically software and internet technologies. But, um, but, uh, but if you can't get there and you need my money to go do that, then that's, I mean, I guess it's kind of wait. I have, yeah. why, why would it be that? Yeah. With the exception of people who are serial entrepreneurs and have been selling yeah, companies course. and making because people. they already have the formula. Yeah. You yeah. know, they, they, I believe that those people have their set of go-tos and they're raising money early simply because they can. Yeah. You know, so, so some of those folks, yeah. But if you're a first or second time entrepreneur and it wasn't Instagram the first time, then, uh, then you know, you're, you need to prove a little more. <laughs> I want to go back to uh, the guy that comes up to you at the panels at okay. conferences because part of the story between me and you of how we kind of became oh, friends yeah. was at the Founder Showcase mm-hmm. uh, when I was with Founder Institute and we had a panel and George Zachary was uh, sick. So yeah. Did he actually vomit? Because that would be no, he like, was, that would make the story he better. Was, he was actually sick. So yeah. Leaving our, leaving the, a panel midstream, midstream is pretty yeah. serious. So Dale turns yeah. to him he's like, dude, we need another judge. And he's like, can you ask Christine? I'm like, sure. You're so like, who's Christine? Running, <laughs> you know, we knew each other. Yeah, but yeah, I, uh, we knew each other, but uh, <laughs> not like closely. And so yeah. I'm running around like looking for Christine at Microsoft. And uh, I see her in the corner uh, on the phone. <laughs> With the, like, with the spreadsheet open. With the spreadsheet open. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so... We were neg- what, negoti- what you, literally negotiating you, a deal. Pro- you know, I don't remember what it was now, but it probably had something to do with, like, fighting about option pool size yeah. or, like, it, figuring it out who... Yeah, it was an important call. So, what do I do? I wrote a sign out saying, hey, Christine, George is like, can you jump on the panel? And you're just like, yep. Done. Yeah, no, there was no verbal communication no. whatsoever. Sign goes up, thumb goes okay. up. And, uh, you know, so I'm sitting there, I'm working and, you know, cause we didn't, we and I had really no relationship before that, but like, you know, but, you know, again, knew who you were, knew you were with the conference and so forth. And, uh, and so Nima runs up and he wants to talk to me and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and then he, and then he goes, so I actually gave you paper in the pen <laughs> while I'm talking, you know, negotiating this deal. Oh my God. And then you write this out, show it up. I'm like, yes, now go away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Christine, I'm gonna you. What was your thought at that moment? Uh, I, you know what? I really wasn't thinking about it that much in that moment. I was all I, all, the only thought process I needed to no, go to we, was how about? much longer I needed to be on the phone, which I think was like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I think I did, you know, like yeah, I did something. You did something to indicate when you actually needed yeah. me, and I'm like, okay. No, I'm saying like, I'll what do you think about me? Like, uh, okay, great. Like, this guy is... Like, who's this crazy, to, who's this right? crazy hustler? Okay, right. And so, yeah. um, fast forward, we, we've had a few more, you know, uh-huh. interactions where, you know, I helped you... Other things you've crazy right? hustled yeah, to make me do? crazy hustled, right? But, <laughs> but like, in Austin, I think we did that event. Mm-hmm. Um, which went great. Which went great. We had 500 people wanting to pitch you and David Bloomberg and Aldo. And you're like, hey, can you manage this? I'm like, sure. Sure. And so we had 60 slots. And uh, it ended up that we had, like, I squeezed in 90 companies to pitch. And then we ended up doing the ad hoc VC pitches on yeah. the RV with David and John. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about this with David. Um, App boy, Mark, ended up raising money from David Bloomberg yeah. talking in the back of the RV. Right? Yeah, so, so did uh, Brett Martin from Sonar from in the, at the event, at yeah. the venue. So, so, I mean, if you think about it, here, like, we kind of just randomly met. And again, I never pitched you for an investment because uh, I've, I've never actually... Well, you've never been, yeah, you haven't been so, in that position. But for some reason, we've always had these funny interactions, <laughs> which brings me up to the next funny rea- interaction. Uh-oh. You are the person who convinced me how powerful social media is, personally. Because ah. you know I don't have Facebook. Because of the refrigerator? The refrigerator. Okay. Exactly. So you must have known about that before the refrigerator, though. No, I. What, what do you mean the the power? That, the power of social media before then, though. You know, what? I I just I was trying to like really avoid it. I don't know what it was. Like <laughs> I had my little Twitter handle, Chief Dealmaker, yeah. and like Facebook is just like a time sink for me. So I just yeah. wanted to stay away. But tell us the refrigerator. Yeah, story. Yes, I'll tell you the refrigerator it totally story. Really. 
So, uh, and this is a very random story, and I, I and I have to apologize if anyone follows me on Twitter. Um, you know about the refrigerator, uh, and I, I I did use you like a dirty washcloth to like get what I wanted in this situation. So um, so anyway, uh, so gosh, it's almost a year ago. So almost a year ago, um, I, if I, I and I remember the timeline is actually a little upsetting to me if I think about it too closely, but I'll throw it out. So I think last April, I have been I have been deeply, deeply excited about an enormous refrigerator for a long time. I've, I do the big dinners and I never have enough room. And, and, uh, and so, you know, when I would see a 48 inch wide counter depth, <laughs> ah, just the love light would go on in my eyes. And, but they're so expensive, you know, like they're ridiculously expensive. It's like, I have a car that's worth less than these, right? I have my, I have a Miata, like my old car is worth like, I think $3,000. So it's actually worth less than these refrigerators. So, um, so I know, so I was looking around and, uh, I have this where I troll, you know, because you're waiting for it. And I found one. I was like, ah, there's one on sale. I can get it right now. And uh, it was from uh, from Sears, which is a pretty big American retail sure. brand, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I'm very excited. I, you know, call the store. I get it ordered and um, arrange for it to be delivered. And... Uh, you know, you get all excited. You get your house ready for the new. You cut the counter because you need more space, and you know, you get ready to move the other one out. And uh, and so they they show up, and the delivery guys like, oh, we can't deliver to you because we need more people, and it's a really big fridge, and you have stairs, and there's only two of us. I'm like, okay, all right. And, you know, you you kind of knew where I lived, and that I had stairs, but uh, all right. So they come back the next day and they have four guys and and the next day they say, oh, well, we're not allowed to take it upstairs. I'm like, <laughs> well, we had this conversation yesterday when the other guy saw the stairs and, you know, two weeks before that when I told the person on the phone for delivery that I have stairs. So I still have not, I still have not touched social media. So I, I didn't go there first. Yeah. Right. But, but so you're, it you're, escalated. You empty out your fridge. Uh, the oh yeah. Mass. Multiple times. Yeah. Multiple times. It's coming in and out. So, uh, so my, my annoyance dials up a little bit each time. Yeah. So the next day they come back again, again with the four guy team, uh, and the straps and they made us sign a waiver for, um, if not damaging the stairs, bringing it up. And I'm like, I, I need to replace my stairs anyway. So we're like, fine, fine, whatever. Just, just get the thing in the house. Sure. So they bring it in, they deliver it. And I was not home for this, but apparently, um, when they went to plug it in, sparks came shooting out across my kitchen where my then two-year-old was my, was in the room my friend your friend Callista, Callista. Yes. so uh, my two-year-olds in the room and like sparks go shooting across the kitchen the guy who plugs it in literally gets thrown back because he's electrocuted himself um, and uh, and so what has happened is somewhere in between I don't know because they've come to our house with this refrigerator multiple times so you don't even know where the blame goes mm -hmm. was it getting to the warehouse from the store was it the first time it came out or when it went back or came out or went back? You know, who knows so uh, somewhere along that route um, someone severed the cord and rather than saying oops I broke this cord let's get them a new refrigerator they took the end and they jammed it up inside <laughs> they jammed it up inside the coils of the back metal so you wouldn't see it was broken Wow. And then on top of that, there were all these like dents all over the, like they basically drop kicked this thing to my house apparently. And for an 800 pound item, that's, you know, surprising. So, uh, so anyway, so I was not happy and, uh, I get on the phone with, uh, I sort of call and I'm told I can have a $50 gift card in exchange for my trouble. <laughs> Yeah, literally. Uh, and uh, and when I didn't like that, they offered me a $100 gift card. And the woman said, that's the best I can do. And I was like, I don't think that's the best you can do. <laughs> it is not. I, someone needs to own up the responsibility for this. And then, you know, most of the time I'm pretty easygoing. Yeah, and, you know, I'm and I'm very, I like not. to be organized. Yeah. But, you know, I'm mostly friendly. And, uh, but I, I definitely believe in moral high ground and I think people should do the right thing. And I was very upset that they were not taking ownership of, of a problem they had created. So, uh, so anyway, so I'm upset and, uh, and I try calling the store again, sort of same reaction. There's nothing they can do. And, uh, and so I go onto social media, I go onto Twitter, um, where I think at the time I had... I have about 21,000 followers now. I think at the time I had maybe 14, 14 you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
And Sears, by the way, uh, Sears has about 20,000 followers. So, mm. <laughs> so, uh, so there was definitely, there's, there was, I didn't feel like I was at a power disadvantage once I go onto Twitter. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like my voice is almost as loud as theirs on Twitter. Well, you have muscle behind you too. Yeah, well, you know, what, like, well, I care a lot about it because meanwhile, and meanwhile, it didn't work because there was no cord. Yeah. They had already taken our other fridge away. So I have a two year old child uh, and no way to keep cold milk or food for that child. I mean, I was, I was as furious as you could be. Yeah. Um, the $50 gift card again, not cutting it. Not cutting it. So I have, if you go to my Twitter history, go to at Christine, you can have some fun. <laughs> at Christine and at Sears, and you'll see all this stuff show up. And, uh, and I'm just details. Like I pounded out, I think the first day, I think like 10 or 12 <laughs> tweets about was told this lighting my kitchen on fire, electrocuting people. Oh, I mean, uh, I literally almost pissed my pants when you told me this story. Yeah. So, so I put out, you know, 10 or 12 tweets and, uh, within like an hour, I had, uh, a response from, you know, Sears cares at Sears cares. And, uh, and they were, you know, you know, Christine, very sorry, you know, please DM us your contact info and, you know, address as quickly as you can. So, uh, so I DM'd them my contact info. And meanwhile, I did not follow them, so they could not DM mm. to me. The only way they could connect to me was to do so publicly. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> social media strategy, what it was. So, uh, so anyway, so we got a response, and they said, go get yourself a little mini fridge or rent one, and we'll reimburse you. So, you know, we don't want you to not have food for your child, uh, which I appreciated. Um, so... Uh, it took a little anger edge off and um, we went from there and I'd say over the next, let's see, that was in April, May. So May, June, July, August, September, five months spent where this is broken. We'll send someone to fix it. Great. Someone comes to the house, they can't fix it or they find something else wrong with this thing that's been drop kicked to my house. Um, meanwhile, the kitchen, you know, building the thing around it, like none of this work is happening cause I don't know what's happening with the fridge. And so, it, you know, some chaos, which I was, not upset, which I was upset about. And, uh, and so six months, you know, I'm sorry, four months, four months, four months, five months, however the one it was. And at the end of it, I still have this broken fridge in my kitchen. I have felt very guilty about forcing the people who follow me on Twitter, probably not for home appliances. Yeah. <laughs> have to keep hearing about my fight with Sears, um, and my, my, you know, just wrath. And, uh, and I was to this point where I wouldn't get a call back. I wouldn't get attention. And the only way I got responses is when I would take the same thing I'd left over two or three voicemails or one or two emails, find 140 word way of saying it, put it into Twitter cleanly, and then put an angry one around it. <laughs> and then within two hours, I'd have a response. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And then finally, I think, VP of something like someone called and said, yeah, and, and I very quickly, stop or something like no, that. no. That, so, so at the beginning when Sears cares first responded, um, after when it wasn't resolved within a week and I was still being very ang- angry on Twitter, uh, they kicked me up to Sears executive offices. Mm-hmm. So I had, you know, the VIP support, but it was not necessarily, and, and you know, I don't know how, who's what fault cause I know they subcontract and so, yeah. but I kind of don't care as a customer, no, right? I just want you to fix the problem you created. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that, I think Sears is an older company that hasn't yet really grasped, um, like how powerful this is. Yeah. This, and, and the fact they have people paying attention is great. And clearly they pay a lot of attention or they wouldn't have responded in social media as quickly. But I think the integration of that back into the rest of the organization for feedback and customer first and things like that, like just some of those cultural changes haven't happened, you know, to go along with the, okay, we need to have a presence, Hmm. you know, sort of on this platform, right? There's a difference between being present on the platform and really engaging in a community and being a responsible community member. They're right. It's it's a nuance. Who's doing a good job? Uh, I've heard they're doing a good job as yeah, well, uh, and uh, you know, and the, you know, Cory Booker does a good job. So there's some good government out there too. <laughs> um, so anyway, so finally, uh, they got back to me in September or so and said, "All right, we're just going to give you a new fridge because finally, I had someone come out who knew what they were doing. Like my tenth repair guy came out and said, "This isn't repairable. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to put a green tag on it that says, you know, cannot be repaired, and we'll get you a new one." I'm like. Wow, would that have been nice okay. the first time? So 
Can you send two us months later. Can you send us a picture of the fridge so we can put it on a? Uh, uh, I have the new one. No, I can send the new one. Yeah. We want to show the, the new power one of is beautiful. We want to show it's beautiful. It's this. Media. It's this beautiful KitchenAid. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, See? it's forty-eight inches. <laughs> so, the ice in the door. So oh. should we call um, yeah. Evan and the guys at Twitter and thank them? For thank the them for helping me. Yeah, because because right. seriously, if there had not, if I had not been able to sort of harness that in some way, I would have wasted so much I would have had to get rid of it or pay to replace mm-hmm. it or I had something frankly that was dangerous because you know they it shorted out the whole yeah, system course, when the sparks ran so like everything is all patched together and that's not really good on no. big expensive machines in your house with a two-year-old running around. with a two-year-old running around so okay. yeah so uh you know one of the things we didn't we skipped mm. which is really really important like, mm. uh, we talk about the syndication thing mm-hmm. really quickly and then we want to jump into uh uh lessons through stories Officially, the, Officially topic, the, the, topic? the topic, which is kind of related between both yeah. of us. And you're going to uh, cut all half of this out anyway, so it's yeah. all good. <laughs> Actually, uh, all this is pretty cool. Oh, it's cool. Uh, I, I, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. I, you know, uh, these stories are you're easy. very unique. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about that really quickly, mm-hmm. the syndication thing. Because, um, again, I think there's this misconception, or people don't really understand what that means. You know, the, right. the, 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 the nature of syndication. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting too because just when you think you know how it's going to work, it's going to work a different way. Mm. So, uh, so syndication essentially means that uh, rather than one investor coming and you know if you're raising a million dollars or ten million dollars or whatever it is, um, one investor comes and writes you one check. Uh, that rarely happens. It's often syndicated where you have multiple people writing you checks that will add up to that amount. So uh, when a deal is syndicated. Um, at uh, at the angel level, it's very informal. You just go out one on one, and people write you personal checks, and you're done. Um, but if you have a uh, a lead investor who actually says, "Here's a term sheet where I'm going to price, you know, either capping a note, and I'm going to set that cap, or I'm going to price the equity in your company," um, you have that lead investor who does that. Uh, it often gets syndicated around it. And so one of the reasons you would want to syndicate would be to have, you know, multiple hands making light of work, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's nice to have multiple hands helping you. It's good to have um, uh, multiple networks that you can leverage for your business or multiple sets of expertise. Now, one of the challenges is when you syndicate, the people who are involved need to have enough money at risk for it to be worth their time. So if someone normally writes $5 million checks, but they like you, mm-hmm. and they, oh, well, someone else is going to write $4 million and you've got a million left over, so I'll put in half of that, I'll give you 500 k um, That 500 k might not be enough for them, you know, professionally, it would not be a good priority for them, not a good use of their time. Yeah. They should be putting their time into uh, the companies where they put $5 million. Yeah. So you won't get the same kind of access or leverage. Uh, sure. Now, caveat, if you have a close personal relationship, mm-hmm. you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. You'll get it anyway. Sure. Um, back to having the good personal relationships. But so let me ask you a question. Um, obviously, the the syndicating partners, mm-hmm. uh, different funds or firms or investors, right. have to agree on the valuation, the terms, and all, and all the details. Uh, not necessarily. Often, no. what yeah, often what ends up happening is if there is one person who's taking up the lion's share of the funds being raised, lead. yeah, the lead investor. If you have a single lead, um, often what happens is the deal gets presented as here's the deal, take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. to the other folks. Now, you might modify it a little bit if there's someone you really want and sure. there's something they've got to be in their bonnet about that they, they don't like. Um, but typically, those terms don't change very much. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, You know, like maybe modest things, like maybe, you know, they want you to have a little more option pool or, you know, maybe they want you to raise a little more money. That actually does happen yeah. quite a bit where you might have terms for, you know, uh, it's a ten million dollar valuation, and you're going to raise four million. But the other investor says, "Well, I'd love to participate. Here's all the great things I can do for the company, but I really want you to raise five million instead, so that I can put more money in and feel like it's worth my time." And so that that part changes a bit, um, but often the rest. Uh, uh, so the amount of new cash coming in might change, but often the rest stays pretty stable. Cool. Um, and, and I think the biggest challenge to syndication uh, on the investor side is. Most funds, not all, uh, we don't, for example, um, but most funds have what's called a a hurdle rate, which Mm -hmm. is we don't write anyone a check unless we can get a certain percentage of that company in uh, ownership. And that's because of the time allocation issue, right? Okay. 
So, um, so sometimes if you only want to sell a third of your company, but you have two investors that you'd love to work with, but both of them say, well, I, if I don't get 20%, I'm not playing. Mm-hmm. Then you're like, well, you either have to not take both investors or you have to instead sell 40% of your business. So you get to some yeah. challenges there. And that doesn't get easier as you get larger and larger. raise more money. Yeah, because often the people coming in keep having hurdle rates. Yeah. Okay, so we're almost done, but we're at the point where we do lessons through stories, right? Mm. And we've talked about this topic. Oh, here we go. Now, what's funny about the topic, we're going to do something really interesting. The topic wow, well, I've got... S- pick. This one is super fun. No, this one I'm <laughs> going to pick for you, and there's a reason. So when okay. I grow up, I want to be. Right. Now, I want you to just tell my story of what you've seen me talk to you, pitch you. Oh, my goodness. And, and then the funny thing is, when I actually ended up telling you about the show... You told me, uh, when I say I finally figured out what I want to be when I grow up and the, mm-hmm. the show, you're like, wait a second, I haven't figured it out myself. So, yeah. tell us, you know. Well, I don't know. So, that means I don't have an answer. No, that's the thing. <laughs> so, tell my story. Like, that, oh, your you've story. Been there a long but way. I'm still skeptical that you've actually found Come exactly on. what you this wanted. Because I don't believe people thing. really know. No, I just don't believe. I fundamentally, feel, I have a philosophical disagreement. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, so I think that. It's possible to have found your exact center, your exact yeah. right place in life. But I think, you know, 90% of the people on this earth don't ever really find that place. There's always something new that they discover. There's always something new you discover that you're interested in that you had no idea. There's always something about your day that was not exactly what you wanted to be doing. Sure. So there's always an opportunity to make that better um, or to evolve, right? Because we all evolve. And there are things that you know, I'm sure you find interesting now that you would not have liked 15 years ago. Of course. But I'm so. saying, like, I'm 35. Yeah. And I just figured this out after, you know, the pit me. You've pivoted. You're just pivoting. Five times. Uh, That's not so bad. But, but, I think of it as versioning because I'm a software oh girl. God. Yeah. So I actually have a whole book treatment for this that I have to write sometime, but I haven't. Okay. Because I have so much extra time now. Um, but uh, I don't believe that people become done. And to me, mm-hmm. saying I've, I've figured out what I want to do or how I'm going to be, like that implies a sense of doneness. Um, whereas I think what it's more like is versioning or iteration. And so, you know, so I think that in my experience, they you know you, I've seen, I think, three or four versions, right? Mm-hmm. I've seen the version where you were part of uh, Founders Institute And you were getting to know startups and you were really excited about reaching out with these innovative people that were creative and, you know, motivated to build things. And um, and as part of that, you were helping to build the Institute as well. Right. So and I think that's one of the interesting things about uh, a lot of venture fund guys. Right. Like they they want to build something and they like to work with builders. Um, So. uh, So there was that Nima. Right. (laughs) And then I got to know the Nima of I'm not getting to do enough building myself, right? Exactly. And so I need to be in a position where I have more of my skin in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still love working with entrepreneurs. Yep. Um, I still love working with builders. And, you know, what are the ways that I might be able to do that? And you mm-hmm. started reaching out to folks and um, sort of got to this place, you know, where you first started putting Pit Me together and, you know, this initial vision of how do I uh, go get this started in the Middle East, yep. right? And so you sort of did this pivot from working in established environments and, you know, building something new to, okay, I'm going to build something new and it's not going to be an established environment and it's going to be a very different type of entrepreneur. But, you know, some of those basic themes of what you liked about those experiences didn't really change, right? right. So there's a little pivot in there. Uh, Next version. Mm-hmm. You know, you made it better. You added cool. some functionality. Uh, and then uh, you went out, sort of looked at that landscape yeah. um, and what was the investment, because before it was specifically investing. And yeah. you said, okay, well, what's the investing opportunity? And, you know, that's a whole different business to get into where you're going out and you're fundraising yourself because you need limited partners. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to set up the infrastructure to manage a portfolio where, you know, you've placed those bets and, you know, every three or four years you have to go out and raise more money. I mean, it's a, it's a different business to be in. Um, and so, uh, and then you said, as far as I can tell, uh, wow, I'm not really excited about that part. That's <laughs> not, it was like, that's it was not like something I'm passionate about. Yeah. You know, it's like, so again, this theme for you of like, what's, what's that, uh, what's right. What's the core value proposition, right? If you're going on the product theme, it's still, 
I want to work with entrepreneurs. I want to help them build things totally. and help them become better, right? And so that has not changed at all. Okay. I think the things that have changed have just been, you know, sort of what's the color around that. And as you develop your own network and, you know, you develop more expertise and sophistication, you know, sort of on these dynamics um, and, you know, what are the resources you can bring to bear? Mm-hmm. Like, cause you didn't have the resources for what you're doing now mm-hmm. five years ago. No, definitely. Right. But you still loved working with entrepreneurs five years ago. Exactly. Right. So, so that's, that's how I think about I, it. I just call it that it's the same path or vision. I'm just using a different vehicle. That's how yeah. I see it. And uh, yeah. at times it's a beater and times it's a <laughs> motorcycle and times it's a Ferrari, you know, like yeah. it, it just depends on the time. But I, uh, I, I really think that this is, fun, interesting, and I, what I really want to do is I want to empower and teach and educate entrepreneurs in the Middle East, and yeah. so we're partnering with Arabnet, you know, and mm-hmm. translating this into Arabic, and so hopefully people will learn from these stories and these um, conversations. Um, so to wrap it up, I have something for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, this gosh. is a c- certificate of achievement. Cool as we see. Now, the wow. Part about it is, is that I have never, and I probably never will pitch you a business, but you've spent a lot of time, you know, looking at the stupid PPM. Your and crazy stuff. Uh, crazy stuff. So, I have looked at your crazy uh, stuff. And you were never going to write me a check. You know, I'm being yeah. low, I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> someday, someday. Not, I'm not anticipating it yet, <laughs> but you know, okay. you never say never. Okay. And then, so usually we Thank give you. our guests uh, Pit Me t-shirts, but <laughs> since you were there. I do lunch, already have one. You have one. So 2.0 gift. Oh, the 2.0. Is you nice. are officially the first Pit me person sneakers? Other than How did you make Pit Me sneakers? Uh, That's freaking Gemma awesome. Gemma from Design Like Whoa surprised me. She makes our t-shirts and she <laughs> made these. And I saw you wear Converse the last time we met. Oh, how funny. So you would actually wear these. So I would actually wear these. So I hope this is great. I'll, 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 I'll give you some marketing. <laughs> and, then, awesome. and then finally, Mommy Diet is not going to love this. No, no. Shannon, hello. Say hello to Shannon. Shannon joined my diet. Oh. <laughs> Janet, mommy diet is on time out and um send calista my love and um, oh i will tell her, tell her that i miss oh, her these oh these have lots of nuts so like protein is going to balance yeah, it out yes, yeah yeah you can justify it somehow i'll, fresh, I'll find you i can always justify anything fresh from beirut uh, wow thank love. you and um hopefully we'll see you in austin maybe we can do something fun we again will. there and uh i don't know you just uh are uh, super so I'm absolutely happy to be here. Thanks for seeing. Thanks for having me. Thank you. (laughs) Coming. Another episode at the end. Uh, Again, thanks a lot to Christine and hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Peace.